Hi, hi everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, Zero Friction Cycling. Uh, today's going to be a little bit of a different one. So instead of talking about low friction stuff, um, I'm going to delve back into a bit of a side sort of hobby project I was doing for a bit. Haven't been able to get to it for ages and ages. Things have just been so uh, merrily flat out on, on all fronts that um, the chain tensile, uh, tensile testing uh, haven't looked at that for a long time. Um, so it's something that I really just kicked off literally just out of uh, curiosity, just to sort of see um, what we could sort of find and discover. Um, it's one of those things where like bicycle chains break and it's not really that clear sometimes why, sometimes it is, sometimes not. But um, you know, sort of how strong are uh, bicycle chains, um, has the strength uh, changed as we move from say, you know, five speed to eight speed to, you know, now up to 12 speed. Is there a difference between, um, you know, say the really beefy chains like track chains versus our um, more common sort of 11, 12 speed chains? Uh, all that sort of stuff, just trying to see, you know, and, and whether or not there might be a difference between brands and so on. Um, and, so really to do that, uh, there's really not a lot of information out there on the good old internet um, on this topic, I guess, specifically to bicycle chains. And um, especially a derailleur chain, it is under a bit of a different sort of uh, load structure than a lot of you know, industrial chains and so on where um, you know, we, we do have chain line angles come into play. Now, one thing that I guess is fairly important to just cover off right from the start with my chain tensile test um, uh, rig, um, and we're talking about bicycle chains, which do have chain line angles. Um, yeah, you will notice that this is only able to tensile strength test the chain in a straight line. Uh, I did try um, introducing chain line angles into the rig, but the bicycle chain is actually really strong. So even intru introducing, say, a five degree chain line angle like you might get with a big, big combination, it's actually just ripping the teeth off the, the cog um, before the, the chains would fail. So. The, if the chain is is all as it should be, the initial sort of conclusions we got uh, from that or, or obtained from that is that um, if there's no errors with say the, the pin riveting on, on the derailleur chain, then it's going to be very similar strength within the range that it's designed for as its uh, straight line tensile strength. So there may be a slight reduction, uh, there may not. So that was, even though we, we can't test uh, in a chain line, just trying to do so, we did discover, uh, I think a little bit along the way, and that um, sometimes really why a chain is going to fail on you. Um, and I've seen chains fail when they've been ridden around a car park with a brand new bike at like 50 watts while they're just testing out the seat height and a chain has snapped. Um, so it's, it's, it can literally sometimes be just one bad rivet on one link and it's going to cause um, a, a failure there. So the, the old adage, you know, chain is only as strong as its weak link. With a derailleur chain, there is a fair bit of, um, you know, pressure on the, that, that pin riveting. So how well a particular chain uh, model or manufacturer is, is doing the riveting on the pin is going to determine a fair bit with regards to are there a lot of, you know, say failures for that uh, chain brand or model on uh, chain line angles. So that can come into play you know, in those scenarios, which is a lot of the time when you're riding on a chain line angle, um, that's not going to uh, show up in a straight line testing. But uh, we've been working our way down to, I guess, a little bit of, you know, sort of just a bit better knowledge on chain tensile strength overall, which I'll use today to share with you. Now today, this, this video, I'm really, we're just sort of, I haven't been back to this uh, machine for a long, long time and had a sort of spare spot on film day. So I'm tacking this on the end today. So I'm, I'm completely sort of winging my way through it, no prep. So bear with me if I'm more rambly than normal. Um, but I thought, yeah, good opportunity just to try to cover off this, which is uh, on the long list. So, cause it's a bit of fun. And all right, we're gonna also go on a mini, little mini education on, I guess the, the type of forces you're sort of putting through the chain, how they change um, depending on what type of cycling you're doing. Um, and uh, that'll probably help understand then, you know, when I start talking some of the, I guess the Newtons or thousands of Newtons um, for the, uh, how, how strong or t the tensile strength of the chains, that'll probably help relate back a little bit to, um, you know, to, to what you're doing in cycling. And one of the first things to understand though is, so for, in terms of the forces uh, or the, you know, the, the tension that's being put into your chain from your cycling load, a, a part of it to understand to begin with is going to be, wrong way around, um, 
that everything really comes into play from chain ring size to your cadence. So now when you're pedaling, you are obviously putting force through the pedal uh, and, it's just, and, and that is attached to your crank arm. Now your crank arm is a lever. Now there is a whole separate side fun topic, um, which I won't go into a lot about, does the crank arm, like a longer crank arm, give you more power than a shorter crank arm? And there has been some testing uh, that has been done, which is you know, basically saying that no longer crank arms do not give you more power. Um, what you have to remember though, is power is a dynamic measure. Power is a measure basically of work uh, in essence. Power is a measure of your turning force, which is the force that you're putting into the pedal, multiplied by your cadence because that gives you work. If you were to put a lot of force into a pedal but you're only doing one RPM, you can only get so much work done. Um, if you're putting you know, X amount of force in but doing 100 RPM, you know, that multiplies out as to how much power or work you're able to do. Um, where that becomes very important for, I guess, sort of what tensions are going through your chain is that, for instance, if you were doing, let's say, 300 watts, and you had it in the big chain ring and you were doing 100 cadence, then you would have X tension in your, uh, in your chain span. Forgive me, I really can't remember what that is in Newtons. It's been so long since we looked at any of these numbers. If you were then to maintain that same power, uh, you're still doing 300 watts, but you put it into a much taller gear and now you're only doing 50 cadence, then you will have to double the force into your pedal, which is going to double the tension in your chain. So you've got the same power, 300 watts that you're putting out, um, but you can have you know, higher or lower tension in the chain for that power, depending on your uh, cadence. Uh, similarly, your crank length and chain ring size will have an impact on uh, the tension in the chain as well. So we can see that if I'm pedaling and I've got say a 53 tooth chain ring here, what is the stop point? What is holding that, that lever back when I, try to, when I try to turn it is the chain across the chain ring here. That's the stop point. So that lever has that much mechanical advantage at the end of the day over the chain, that distance there. If I'm doing the same force through my pedal, but I'm on a mountain bike, I don't have an ice big road chain ring, I'm doing the same force through my pedal, but the chain stop point is here because that's where the chain ring is. It's a much shorter, shorter chain ring. Then the leverage over, of, of my crank arm over the chain is, is much greater. So again, for the same pedaling force or the same power, you have a lot more tension in the chain in a smaller chain ring than you do in a large chain ring. Obviously, if you can imagine if you had, say, a, a Victor Campenart 60 tooth chain ring or a 58 tooth in his, um, uh, one of his latest uh, classics, you know, the, the, the chain ring is gonna be coming up to, uh, you know, about here and there, there's a much lesser leverage from the crank arm over where the, uh, the chain is being held to a, a stop or whether, whether the, the back force is basically of what you're trying to turn. So, same force that you can generate into the pedal, your uh, chain ring size will have a very large impact on uh, the amount of tension that is in that chain span. Uh, so obviously quite simply that equates to if you were going to um, stomp out uh, 600 watts on a really steep pinch power climb, um, and you're doing that uh, on a road bike in a 52 tooth chain ring, or you're doing that on a mountain bike on a 32 tooth chain ring, the chain is under a lot, lot more tension load and a lot higher chance of failure um, in a mountain bike chain ring than it is in your large chain ring. So it's often also why you don't see a lot of um, chain failures, even by the most powerful sprinters uh, in the peloton when they're in that, you know, 53, uh, 12 or 53, 11, chain line's fairly straight, they're in the big chain ring, um, they're often running fairly big chain rings, so you know they're putting out monster power, it's usually at a pretty high cadence, um, so they might be doing 100 to 130 cadence uh, in their sprints, big chain ring, so the chain tensions aren't actually that, that crazy, um, whereas uh, a lot of times, say, in, in an in off-road mountain bike, you, know, you can be running um, up some really steep pinches, putting out to really high, uh, high t tension and often in some pretty big chain line angles uh, to get up those steep pinches. And so the, the chains under it can be under a lot more strain at say, you know, a 800 watt burst up a, uh, a steep incline in a mountain bike than what the best sprinters are doing in their, uh, in their 50, uh, you know, 4, uh, 12. 
So that's, that's a little bit, so crank length, um, so the, the length of the lever does matter. So the whole thing about, you know, is a longer crank more powerful than a shorter crank? No. The reason why that tested out as such is because uh, basically people are able to attain a higher cadence in the shorter crank, which kind of evens out the, uh, the longer or the shorter lever. So it's easier to spin a very fast circle with a shorter crank length than it is to do so you can imagine if this was sort of a, a 205 mil, uh, mil, mil crank, trying to do um, 150 cadence in an all-out power test would be pretty tough. Whereas if it's a 140 mil crank, you know, you can spin a really nice circle in that. And so the, the power figure is your pedaling force, the force you can, you can put in multiplied by RPM. And so for power, they really didn't find a difference between, I think it was about 145 mil crank lengths and I think it went up to, uh, it sort of only started to drop off after about, I think it was around the 205 mil. So within a pretty extreme range, it's power measure stayed about the same. However, for leverage, so you may have heard sometimes that people say that uh, a longer crank length, will, crank length will give you greater leverage. A longer crank length will give you greater leverage for that I guess what you call the peak power phase where you are really putting the force down there. If you can imagine, uh, if people sort of think, no, it doesn't, again, we just take things to extreme. Let's say my chain ring is here and my crank length is here and you wanted to exert maximum force through that chain because you had to crack something open at this end. And if your lever is only that long and your, that, that's the size of your uh, mechanical advantage over turning your chain, and then man, imagine, I guess, if I put a, a breaker bar on the end of this crank arm and I'm going to put the same amount of force that I'm putting there on the end of that breaker bar to try to turn the chain ring. Hopefully, fairly obviously, the same force out here on this lever is going to generate a lot more uh, tension into the chain for the same force as if I was, I was putting that force in here. So a longer crank arm does give you more leverage. Um, so whether or not that helps you, it really then comes down to can you maintain the cadence that you really need to maintain with the gearing that you have? So um, a longer lever may, and this is may because it depends on a few sort of cycling dynamics as well, may help, you know, for instance, if you're doing some stuff where you cannot maintain the cadence uh, for the gearing that you have. Um, if you can maintain the cadence for the power that you want to uh, uh, put out for the duration you need to put it out and you can do that with a shorter crank arm, Generally, that's to your advantage because you've got a better pedaling circle in the shorter crank arms. A lot of stuff is out these days to say that always err on shorter uh, if in doubt because uh, you can spin them up faster. And the gearing is there to, to basically take up, you know, these small differences in leverage between say a 175, 170, 165. It's why in triathlon they often run a lot shorter cranks. Um, you know, it gives them a, a much more ability or, or sort of, um, uh, much more flexibility with their position that they can get into because their knees are not coming up as high so they can achieve a more aero position. Uh, you've got gearing, you don't need all the leverage if you can uh, achieve what you need to achieve um, uh, through that side. If you, if you, if for instance though, if I was to hit a 30% um, a pinch, pinch off road um, and do that a lot in a, in a XE uh, race lap, I'm probably not going to want to run a, um, you know, 160 mil crank. I might be looking for something a bit longer because I'm probably going to be dropping down to, you know, maybe 40 cadence to get to get over that pinch, uh, in which case a longer lever, it does help in that situation. Uh, you just got to make sure it's not being, it's not a disadvantage to you in the, the more uh, faster sections where you want to spin up. So that's a little bit, I guess, of, you know, crank length versus power versus leverage and uh, the tensions that will uh, be greater or smaller in your chain depending on your chain ring size and your lever length in relation to where that, that chain ring finishes and also obviously how that changes with cadence. So that's why it's a pretty dynamic figure. So, um, and I'm really, I'd, I'd have to check, but I think like if you're doing say about a thousand watts, so pretty decent uh, power at sort of a hundred cadence in your large chain ring, I think from memory, um, with a 53 tooth and a 175 crank, I think it calculated out to somewhere around 400 newtons of, uh, of, of tension in the chain. Now, uh, how strong are bicycle chains? So there is an international standard for bicycle chains that they need to be over 8,000 newtons um, in their tensile strength. So there's a pretty big safety factor for that particular scenario. Um, however, 
Um, there can be scenarios such as mountain biking, longer crank, smaller chain rings, extreme chain lines, you know, really putting out a huge amount of sort of torque force uh, where those, those tensions might be able to get up to, you know, maybe you can double that to sort of 800 newtons. Still a long, long way from um, the international standard of 8,000 uh, newtons in terms of uh, strength. Um, so most bicycle chains will be at least as strong that we could do at least around 6,000 watts of power, which obviously I don't know of anyone that, that, uh, that does that. Um, uh, obviously not quite close. I think the strongest, strongest track sprinters might, you know, sort of be pumping out sometimes peak powers around a bit over 2,500 watts. So in theory, there's a really big safety uh, buffer on the tensile strength of our chains versus what we can possibly produce. And in most normal circumstances, what mortals are doing on their, uh, say, road bike, the newtons of force that we're putting through the bicycle chain will generally be in the hundreds. And we have, in theory, a bicycle chain that is at least 8,000 newton uh, strong. So pretty big, big buffer there. Um, do bicycle chains test out to meet that international standard? Uh, the short answer is yes, I have tested some super cheap chains, like literally like five buck chains that I've bought off eBay. And uh, in the straight line test, they've all actually been over uh, 8,000 newtons, which surprised me. I thought I would find um, at least one sort of dud junk chain out there that, that just crapped out pretty early. But surprisingly so far, um, all chains tested have been uh, over the 8,000 in, uh, in the tensile test, which is what they need to pass. So, uh, so that's pretty good. Now, um, uh, one of the, the things as well, though, that we wanted to look at um, in, I guess, this journey was, uh, say, apart from the different speeds, so are chains stronger at eight speed because they're thicker versus, say, an 11 or 12 speed? Uh, the answer to that is no, uh, not, not in a straight line test. Um, so they're basically all coming out somewhere over that 8,000 range. Most, most of the chains tested are coming out somewhere between about 8,800 newtons to sort of about 9,200 newtons. That's about the, the average. Um, but for instance, um, probably the strongest uh, chain I've tested so far is the SRAM Eagle 12 speed, which was over 12,000 newtons. That's really, really strong. Um, but uh, and this is not a, a slide at SRAM, the SRAM Eagle chains have probably had the highest, um, you know, sort of warranty failure rate for snapping of any of the chains that, uh, that I do. So there's, there's definitely something going on there with obviously the, the challenge with the riveting with having such a thin chain. And an eight speed chain that's got protruding pins is likely to have a lot less issue with say a riveting uh, failure versus um, an 11 or 12 speed chain. Um, and so that's that, that nuance that we're sort of you know, can't really nail on this type of uh, machine, but you know, we're getting broad-based knowledge, I guess, just by getting the data that we do get from the outright tensile strength of the chains in a straight line versus what we, you know, sort of see uh, happen in the real world. Um, now, another thing that is, I guess, been a bit of interest is, um, say, you know, the, the one-eighth, the really sort of your beefy one-eighth track chains uh, versus your you know, derailleur chains. Um, and yeah, there was a sort of a, a bit of a school of thought from some that the track chains wouldn't actually test out very, uh, you know, much stronger, if at all stronger than a, just a normal derailleur chain. Because a lot of track chains are actually really cheap. Um, so you can, for instance, get, say, an Izumi standard for eBay, on eBay for about $30, whereas, say, a Durace chain, you know, retails for about $90. So, and the one eighth chain is a lot, it's got a lot more steel. Um, now, if you're buying a lot more steel for a third the price, uh, odds are it's going to be uh, cheaper, softer steel. And that really bore out to be the case where what we see, not only do the, the one eighth track chain, so even the Azumi Super Toughness, um, not only do they fail at a very similar Newtons to say an Ultegra or a Durace chain, um, but their failure mode is a lot softer. So um, may or may not show up today because we'll do a couple of uh, tensile uh, strength tests what I see with, with those, uh, with those um, the track chains, and not, not, it's not just with the Zoomy, is that they tend to stretch and stretch and stretch and stretch, and they tend to fail by way of the pin being pulled all the way through uh, the roller and the, uh, the end of the outer link plate. So it's a really sort of soft failure, so to speak. Uh, whereas your derailleur chains, 
they obviously stretch because they're being put under huge tension, but they stretch a lot less and then they typically have a much more sudden failure whereby the links snap. And that just backs up basically that it's a harder steel, so it's more brittle. It's not brittle by you know, actual steel brittle standards. The, the chains are still quite ductile. They're, they're obviously made to be a very specific sort of ductility so that they're not just snapping on you know, any old rough gear change. But they are definitely a harder, uh, stronger steel than um, you, what you typically find in a track chain. And again, it makes sense. You're buying a lot more metal for a third the price. It's a cheaper steel. Uh, there's no, no, there's not often sort of economies uh, really work uh, differently than that. And that also shows up in wear rates. Um, track chains, despite their lovely big beefy size versus um, uh, your derailleur chains, a quality derailleur chain will typically well outlast a track chain. So if someone is commuting, uh, on a single speed or you've got hub gears and you think I want the biggest, strongest, longest lasting chain, I'm going to get a nice one eighth uh, track chain. That is not your strongest uh, option and that is not your, um, it's not weaker, but it's not stronger. Um, but it's also is, is most definitely not going to be a longer wearing chain. The steel is softer. They don't have the, um, the chromium plating that you get on quality chains, pins and also on the rollers. You do not get um, the hardening of the, the steel uh, and they do just literally, they just flat out wear out faster. So uh, that's been, that was I guess a bit interesting just to confirm that as well. So some sort of rough numbers, so we basically got uh, say an Ultegra chain, Jurassic, uh, sorry Shimano Ultegra chain, uh, tensile strength at basically 9200 newtons. Um, the Azumi standards were pretty much about the same and Azumi super, super toughness was uh, 9600. The much, much lighter uh, weight, YBN SLA 410, was at 10,500 newtons, so um, that, that was basically about 1,000 newtons stronger than an Azumi Super Toughness, despite being over 100 grams lighter, and, and, and acts much more like a derailleur chain, so it's a, it is a, a more sudden failure, but again, it is at, it's at uh, tensile strengths that you cannot uh, put out uh, you know, from a human, so it, it, it shouldn't really ever come into play and hasn't, hasn't so far. Um, and yeah, most, most of the test out though around about that 9,000 Newton mark, the, the, probably the, the most standout one so far uh, was a Stram Eagle chain at, um, that was I think nearly 12,500 Newton. So that, that was about 3,000 Newtons um, above, you know, say an Altegra, which is, which is a fair bit. And yet, um, to make this whole thing more, yeah, complicated, uh, they do, uh, I get a lot more failures with Eagle uh, than any other chain, especially when I factor in numbers sold. Um, so that'll do for rambling on um, about um, what we sort of discovered so far with chain tensile testing. Um, oh, probably actually one of the things, so one of the things I did manage to do, sorry, was uh, testing whether or not chains um, suffer some tensile strength loss um, as they are worn. So I tested a whole bunch of chains that were um, worn to 0.5% and 1% and there was no um, difference in the average of those chains uh, versus the average of the same chains, brand new. Um, I managed to get a couple of customer chains uh, that were really, really worn, so when, or just when customers had come to see me because uh, they were switching to waxing, their existing chain had been running a poor lube and too long. They were at uh, around sort of over 2% wear, so sort of 2.2 and 2.4% wear. And they tested out still above um, the, global, the industrial standard, which is 8,000 uh, Newtons but only just. Um, and so compared to those same chains new, they were basically a good 10% down uh, in tensile strength on new. But that's, that's a really sort of fairly large wear case, but it is not that uncommon that people run their chains to over 2% wear. And so it does seem to appear that somewhere between say a 1% wear mark and about a 2% wear mark, then the tensile strength of the chain does start to uh, decrease. Uh, again, how much that sort of factors over to what it's going to be on a chain line angle, not sure, but yeah, it, it was interesting to see that uh, there was a measurable difference once we start getting over to those more extreme uh, wear rates. So yeah, that's a, a bit of an overview. Um, one day when I get to, uh, time, which I may, because we're putting on a, um, or by the time this video comes out, I should have my new retail Supreme Leader uh, really up and cranking. Um, but uh, wanting to test, um, you know, uh, different master links, master links after uh, a whole bunch of uses um, versus the same master links new. And one day, um, myself and, uh, and a helper, we may have a, 
another crack at, at how we might be able to start testing with, um, with introducing uh, some chain line angle in there and, and see what we get. But it is a hobby project and we've got well, a fair bit of other test stuff uh, on the go, so we'll see. All right, so we will launch into, I'm, I'm gonna test, um, we'll do, we'll tensile test a couple of chains while we're here, probably maybe two or three. Um, this one is a, uh, a track chain. I was actually meant to test this for ceramic speed as part of the uh, assessment that uh, we were doing at the time for um, a number of countries that were wondering what chain to run for the um, Tokyo Olympics. Uh, I, I, this is one I just, oh, sorry, ceramic speed, I flat out ran out of time to, uh, to test it. Um, but I'm testing it now. Uh, so we'll know for the next Olympics whether this one is, uh, is stronger. Um, so the record basically for track chains at the moment is pretty much the, uh, the super toughness at pretty much bang on around 9,600 Newtons. Uh, let's see, uh, sorry, that's for uh, the non-YBN SLA. The YBN 410 track chain is, is, was 10 and a half thousand. So that's the record to beat. For non-YBN, the track chain record is 9.6. So we'll see how the KMC goes. I'll just grab my shield. And whoops, I'm gonna get some safety glasses just in case. I'll see if I remember, it's been so long. Start. Okay. If I stuff it up, I'll have enough chain span to do it again. Okay, 1,000 newtons. Oops, losing pressure. Why is that? Getting some slack taken out by the looks. Okay, 1,000, 2,000. Okay, here we go. Starting uh, again. So we had a, the cog slip, it hasn't happened before. I'll try again. So, all right, 3,000, 4,000 newtons, 5,000, 6,000. 7,000, so stretching, stretching, 8,000, 8.5, 9,000, 9, 1, 9, 3, 9, 5, so 9, 7, there we go, pretty much bang on 9, 8, just hit stop there. And save. Okay, so I'll save that. I'll be able to look that up, but I saw on the display that was basically bang on um, uh, 9,800 uh, newtons. Okay, so I've got the, uh, the KMC E101 chain off the test rig there. So just looking at how it failed. Um, we can sort of see it's almost like a rivet failure where basically the outer plate has bent um, and we can see this has burst off the end of the, the, the pin rivet there. The pin is still in that link. Uh, I've still got it in, in this side of the pin here. Um, so it's pretty much just where the pin and the outer plate link meet that that riveting juncture has stretched and then failed. Um, so that that's a relatively sort of classic failure. I'm just gonna demonstrate that versus the um, when I tested the, uh, the Zumi Super Toughness, um, the bit of a difference, so we can see that the pin is intact pretty solidly in, in both links, and the pin has just literally pulled through the inner plate link uh, shoulders. So it's, it's, it's pulled them through, fairly soft failure still, as it's um, uh, pulled through, um, but the, there's definitely not even a hint, not even budging of the, um, the that outer plate link um, starting to uh, stretch where the pin rivet is. So the pin riveting on the super toughness is, is really uh, extremely good. They have not moved or budged at all. The outer plate links haven't shown really any sign of, of stretching, but the inner plate link, it, it pulled through that um, 
yeah, I, I would say fairly uh, easily once it started going. So uh, Zoom is super toughness. Um, top marks for pin riveting, top marks for outer plate uh, strength, but total overall chain strength at 9,600. Nothing um, exceptional due to the inner plate links, uh, having the pin be able to be pulled right through. And th this value mode, so I've, I've tested, I get to test a chain three times pretty much uh, for the same length of chain. And so I've tested a lot of these chains um, many times over and you get very, very similar uh, results and same failure modes for that same chain. Um, and the E101 though at 9800, so that's come out basically a couple hundred Newton uh, greater than the Azumi Super Toughness. But really that's, that's pretty much a match. If, if I was to test them three times each, um, I'm going to get a variance of about 200 Newtons. So I'm pretty much going to call that about square at 9600 to 9800. Okay, so machine basically reset. Uh, so this one's testing the Shimano Link Glide, which I'd actually wanted to test for, um, for a little bit. Um, so um, Shimano Link Glide are their sort of relatively new, um, supposed to be much more durable and uh, a stronger uh, chain designed for 1011 speed for their e-bike systems um, and really for e-bike riders. So now it is worth noting that Shimano's uh, normal chains, they're um, uh, pretty much across their range now. Uh, they are e-bike rated. So you'll see on the Shimano box uh, boxes, if you look at a Shimano chain anytime soon in a box, it'll have Dynasys on there, which is their basically uh, wording for e-bike. Um, Shimano chains have for a long time been my recommendation, uh, recommended chain for uh, e-bike riders because they have um, 10, 11 speed, they've got uh, okay durability uh, in terms of wear uh, lifespan, but most e-bike chains, believe it or not, and I've tested a, a few, uh, even from like the YBN, which I stopped stocking uh, for their e-bike chain due to just really premature wear, same with the KMC e-bike chain, uh, I forget there was another, um, I think it was the Whipperman. So it seems to be that uh, yeah, for giving you greater pin riveting strength for your e-bike, uh, these chains were just really not bothering giving you any sort of wear durability. So they just wouldn't bother with say the chromium plating and other hardening treatments or wear resistance treatments. So your e-bike chain strong, but wore out super fast and exacerbated by, uh, exacerbated by the fact that you're often riding off-road and people are running wet lubes and it just, yeah, it is just abrading through them in no time. Uh, Shimano uh, chains at least have uh, in the 10, 11 speed, uh, decent, um, you know, wear characteristics. Uh, you know, they're, they're a solid chain and they're e-bike rated. So they've been the number one for a while. Uh, 12 speed, if you're on 12 speed, Shimano and e-bike, their 12 speed chains have around double the durability in terms of wear versus uh, Durace 11. So the, the XTR12, XT12s are a brilliant chain. Uh, I have wear tested this. I haven't had a chance to put that up on the website yet. Um, uh, this did come out at about 50% longer wear uh, versus their um, Ultegra. So that, that is great. That is giving some credence towards the claim that the Link Glide chains are more wear durable than their normal uh, 10 or 11 speed chains. Uh, and so we'll find out live, I haven't tested this before, um, as to whether or not it is also has a greater tensile strength, um, but bearing in mind it is a straight line. Uh, even if it comes out similar to um, Ultegra or just a little bit more or fairly much in line with a lot of chains that are in that sort of nine to 10,000 Newton range, that doesn't necessarily mean that it doesn't have the greater pin riveting strength that the e-bike chains need to handle the, the extra oomph that people are giving it quite often under um, high chain line angles and also under some pretty clunky shifts. So we will, we will test and see. All is about to be revealed. Okay. One thousand newtons, two thousand, three thousand, four thousand, five thousand. They start to slow as they stretch. Six thousand, six and a half, seven thousand, seven and a half, eight thousand. I have to really pump these pretty quick now for losing pressure. And uh, apologies, it's slipping still. 
So, bugger, well, we got one in. Um, so, apologies on behalf of the test rig. We'll, we'll revisit this in the future. Um, would have really liked to see what the link line got up to if it did manage to get uh, something notably better than uh, Ultegra. But uh, yeah, I need to have some strong words uh, with the test rig. And uh, um, yeah, I thought, um, wasn't sure how it would go because yeah, I was winging it a bit today, sort of threw this in at the end of, uh, of the day just while the film guy was here to see if we could get some cool stuff. Um, but anyway, hopefully Sun's just the, uh, the final uh, sort of test of link line going. Hopefully the, um, uh, just the previous info and uh, sort of ramblings on about the chain tensile strength testing uh, and some of the numbers and sort of how they may or may not relate to you and your cycling. Um, and it's really, yeah, at this stage again, it's not something that, you know, we've really got a concrete thing that we can say, aha, this is uh, why chains are definitely going to break, um, you know, or a particular brand or, or whatnot as such. Um, but yeah, we're learning a little bit, um, as we said, just read the you know, uh, different strengths and different uh, speeds versus um, you know, the older chains versus the new thinner chains, uh, Durali chains versus track chains. Um, and just what I guess the, yeah, those sort of failure modes are with the, the pin riveting or whether or not it's a, it's a link plate uh, breaking. Um, and I guess a word of... Um, just from experience and sort of, because whenever, if I get a, a customer uh, chain that's uh, broken and all chains, all chain brands break. So um, I would say that there's, you know, sort of one that's a bit more prevalent than, than another, but um, what is often a cause behind uh, chain snaps? Um, because we've got a bit of a disparity between how much Newtons of force can you put through the chain uh, versus what is the chain's ultimate tensile strength. And we've got a really high safety factor there, even though our, bicycle chains are pretty darn thin these days, they're still, you know, on the surface, a very high uh, safety buffer. So why are they snapping? Um, now, the, the most common cause um, is shifting under high load. Um, so if you're, especially front shifting, so if you're shifting from the small chain ring to the large chain ring, um, there can be a split second. So depending on how that pickup goes, um, there can be a split second where if the pickup's not great, that all of your pedaling load is going through uh, one tooth and one link. And especially if you've got any sort of chain line angle happening um, at that time, you're just going to pry the outer plate off the rivet. Um, and so shifting from small to big under high load uh, is probably the highest failure rate for um, your derailleur chain. Um, so electronic shifting has really exacerbated that. Um, in the days of you know, when everybody was on mechanical shifting, um, there are really, I guess, less failures then than uh, with the advent um, and very wide adoption of electronic. People tend to shift now, um, especially on the front, under loads they never would have dreamt of back in the day of mechanical, where you had to, you know, you could feel the, I guess, the, the tension you'd have to put up, uh, you know, through your lever because the, the harder you're pedaling, the harder that chain is stuck on the small ring, and you have to use your own force through the lever to to get that to shift up onto the big ring. And there was just really a limit as to, as to that. The feedback would let you know that too much pedaling power. Uh, with electronic, you've just got these pretty powerful stepper motors and uh, they, they will pretty much ram that change home. And, uh, and we just get a lot of failures with people shifting under loads that just, yeah, I don't think things are really ever sort of designed to, to take that. There's only so much um, one pin rivet can do if, it's, if the pickup's a bit lazy and you're really pumping out the, the watts through that shift. Uh, similarly, like it, it, it's less likely things can break on a really clunky uh, rear shift. Um, so again, it, it's just a matter of like the, the systems these days are so good, they're so slick on the rear that, that uh, we do tend to shift under a lot higher loads again than what we ever used to in, uh, in mechanical. Um, and it's pretty rare that it happens on road where you get a, um, uh, I guess a snap from a, a bung rear shift or a really crunchy rear shift, you do get um, bent links. And uh, even with the front, you, you probably actually get, we get more bent links than we do um, outright snaps because the, the chain metals are pretty darn good metals um, for the high quality chains where they're fairly, like they're very strong, but they're still fairly ductile. They will tend to um, bend uh, before they snap um, in, in at least sort of half of the cases that we get coming in. So 
bent links are at least as common as, as, as chain snaps for a reason for um, you know, a chain failure, but a bent link will still ruin your ride unless you're um, you know, carrying your chain breaker and spare links, which a lot don't. So, um, so yeah, the, still the main cause by far is um, shifting high load and a bit of a crunch shift. Um, it is exceptionally rare for a chain to snap not during shifting, like when you are in gear, secure in gear, uh, laying down the watts and you get a chain snap. Uh, it does happen, but it is really, really rare. Uh, it, it's probably one in, oh, I'm going to take a, take a stab at just the reports. It's going to be about one in 20 um, where somebody will report that they were securely in gear when the chain snapped. Uh, pretty much every other case, it's during a shift. So that, that's fairly telling as to sort of what's happening. And, and it really does come down to, you know, how much can the rivet handle or is there a poor rivet? So. Um, yeah, that'll do. Um, hope that was sort of interesting as a bit of an intro into that. And one day when I get time, um, yeah, I will uh, see what more we can achieve in the chain tensile testing um, with getting chain line angles, doing a whole bunch of stuff, really master links, reusing master links and so on. And yeah, see what else we can find out. And uh, I'll get this fixed between now and the next one. And um, yeah, and I, I want to get a result for the link light. So, uh, so that'll be good if I can get that done. All right, cool. Thanks, everyone. And don't forget to uh, like and subscribe to the channel and other YouTube type things like share with your friends. Uh, so that'll keep you up to date with the latest low friction news and hints and tips. And um, yeah, also put any comments down below and I can uh, try to look at those and uh, take them into account for future episodes.